it's an honor to be here to be able to talk about this subject uh, it's a subject that's been close to my heart since uh, at the very least third year of law school perhaps introduce them uh, to uh, some of the methods that they may never have experienced or encountered before um, i understand that the audience is largely uh, from a legal background uh, so i will be uh, uh, catering it to that sort of an audience and i will be presuming absolutely no or zero uh, understanding of law and economics from beforehand so i'll be treating this as a basic introduction to law and economics just at the outset i must point out that uh, at the time that i uh, agreed to come forward for this talk i suggested that the topic of the, the name of the topic the name of the, the subject matter should be economic analysis of law uh, i have since then um, realized that there could have been a little terminological uh, difference so i have uh modified the name somewhat to law and economics Th these two names economic analysis of law and law and economics are largely used interchangeably people use both the names for the same subject but um some of the professionals who use this some of the researchers and academicians who use this they like to differentiate between these two subjects um in the sense that economic analysis of law is uh, uh, according to some scholars uh, is the field in which they apply microeconomic tools to legal concepts and uh the aim is often to change the legal concepts to modify them uh and uh, this modification is somewhat implicit in the minds of the economists who come forward and look at the legal uh, at look at legal institutions and legal structures uh but nonetheless other scholars suggest that law and economics is a field separate from or slightly distinct from economic analysis of law where there is no presumption that you have to change the legal field it might just be so is to understand legal concepts better using economic tools so that's what what law and economics would be called it's it's a little bit neutral to the idea of whether economics will actually change law or whether it will just explain law or whether there will be some legal concepts that can actually uh, you know reverse the uh, reverse the flow of concepts there are legal concepts that could help better economic understanding of uh, institutions i had actually prepared a presentation for this uh i was a little unsure as to whether to uh, go forward with the presentation or whether to you know have a face to face talk it's a time in which uh, we have very often we have very little human interaction we don't get to see human faces uh, that regularly so uh, i am thinking that i i will go ahead actually without uh, a presentation at all perhaps and that wouldn't be much of an issue i'll uh, i'll try and explain these issues without a um without a presentation as such right so uh, to start out with law and economics um the question is why would law students and legal professionals of any kind want to know anything about economics in the first place and what is it that economics can provide that can help um uh, legal professionals and law students with uh and uh, at the outset it's important to understand that these two disciplines law on the one hand and economics on the other hand both they come from very two very different backgrounds they have uh, different approaches and methods different concepts at play and uh, most fundamentally they also have different values different aims and objectives that they sometimes implicitly are forwarding so uh, they can sometimes seem in conflict nonetheless they are both actually talking about the same subject matter and that is human behavior and uh, what they seek to do with human behavior is to explain it in a sort of forward looking manner often um and uh, this is why law and economics as a discipline Uh, or an interdisciplinary field has been most effective in the question of policy or legal policy in trying to determine how law should be now most law students here will be very clear that uh, during the course of legal education it was certainly the case with me uh, most of our law classes are to do with uh, most of our most of our legal education much of our legal education is to do with trying to explain how the law is so we are taught about certain statutes we are sometimes given a little background as to why the statute came into place but we are mostly taught about the statutes the provisions and what the provisions mean what their implications would be in a court how a court would likely interpret those provisions so it's largely about how the law is and that's how it often is looked at that the law isn't supposed to be um you know it's supposed to be imagined as something that has to be uh, found out uh, uh, in terms of what is good or bad for society instead what is of what legal practice often involves is just trying to determine uh, what did the legislature say and what did the courts say about this particular legal issue um on the other hand law and economics and certain other disciplines as well they try to explain how the law can be or should be 
this is a policy approach to uh, to legal uh, concepts and institutions uh, uh, my colleagues and i when we work at vidhi center for legal policy we have often been confronted with these issues that when you come with a legal training you aren't very ready to deal with policy issues because you've often been told only about how the law is and especially in areas where there is no prior law where the law has not said anything so far lawyers often find themselves at a complete loss as to what are we supposed to do what is the law supposed to be like um how are we supposed to decide the law and uh, to give you a very small example uh, economics economics students often learn about how uh, macroeconomics uh, is working as it stands right now what the concepts and tools are and they are often given a little bit of an input as to how the government does things when it comes to economics whether there should be more investment by the government whether there should be some change uh, in the job creation that the government creates um whether they should be trying to uh, you know increase fiscal deficit or whether they should be trying to reduce fiscal deficit what the effects of those are this government centric uh, idea when money public finance and um, you know those sort of issues uh, they they actually show how economics has dealt quite considerably with the question of how economics should be like or how economics should be applied without any prior constraints on the other hand law doesn't really give you that uh doesn't give you that flavor very easily when 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 faced with the question of how should we design this particular law we often don't have answers about it so this will be sort of the larger um sort of alignment that you might look at that this particular field or this particular interdisciplinary field will be trying to provide you um some some tools with so uh why economics that's an important question um why should we be dealing with an economic analysis of law or law and economics uh there are other fields of course that deal with human behavior and how human behavior should be like or how we can explain and study it uh politics is there there's psychology political science psychology sociology is there as well there there was a time when sociology of law was a very uh, controlling uh, interdisciplinary field um regarding understanding law um there is also uh, uh philosophy generally speaking moral philosophy that can explain a number of issues when it comes to law uh but what the uh, what the economic discipline does most specifically is that it tries to use some of these economic concepts to bring considerable precision to um legal analysis and to legal policy making so many of the concepts that we are very familiar with in law uh, these are issues like rights privileges powers for example these these kinds of concepts they they get automatically translated in economics into concepts that we might hear more often in the economic context mm. things like uh, benefits incentives or goods these are what rights get aligned with and this is not to say that rights are benefits or rights are incentives but rights are a way in which incentives can be created or rights are a way in which benefits can be given to individuals uh in many ways you'll realize that when somebody is trying to create a law when somebody is trying to design a law for the first time what they are trying to do is they are trying to predict how human behavior will be if the law is not there and if different kinds of alternative legal provisions are created and that you will find is very similar to how economics looks at it when somebody goes into a shop and has to choose between uh, one one particular product and a competing product the kinds of considerations in their minds have often to do with the benefits and the costs that are involved in getting the product so if i have to buy if i have to choose between two kinds of cups i might have to choose between a cup that looks nice and doesn't look so nice and one that costs more and doesn't cost so more uh, doesn't cost as much so this is a sort of a forward looking try uh, predictive analysis as to how things will play out if you do certain kinds of uh, if you take certain kinds of measures so as i mentioned rights are often treated as benefits um and uh, on the other hand uh, duties or punishments or liabilities are treated as costs or or some sort of uh, disabilities or liabilities um so uh one of the issues that we can definitely look at is right so this i broadly tried to explain uh, how an interdisciplinary field has to involve itself with some kind of translation of concepts and uh, here i what i was mentioning uh, was that there is a there's a limited set of translations that we can basically consider as uh, the uh, like the key to a map between uh, trying to understand 
uh, how these concepts get translated. So the way in which economics translates concepts from its own toolbox into the sorry from the legal toolbox into its own its own concepts often involves trying to make these legal concepts which are uh, which are often phrased in very broad terms into more measurable and precise terms that the actual tangible benefits and costs become clearer to the people who are dealing with those particular legal concepts so these are some of the benefits that economics specifically brings to a um, le to legal analysis so uh, how does this sort of a translation take place many would consider that some legal concepts cannot be translated at all to economic concepts um for example uh, would the value that a person uh, that that you try to place in a person's life that a person's life itself how can you try and evaluate it somebody's life should not be evaluated in that manner uh, it can't be measured is the big question that comes up um and let me point out right at the outset that uh, there are many issues with law and economics uh, because of which it is not considered very appropriate for certain kinds of legal analysis so it's actually considered inappropriate to apply legal and anal uh, economic analysis to certain kinds of legal issues uh, but nonetheless it it is applied and it often is applied in very practical senses when we have no other option for example in insurance uh, there is some level of economic measurement of a person's life when you try and deal with life insurance there are certain criteria by which one tries to evaluate the um, the value of a person's life itself so as to be able to determine what the risks uh, and the risks can be how the risk can be measured and how a premium can be paid for um, you know taking care of that risk or alleviating ameliorating that risk so how they try and do this in many situations is that even if there is no market regarding a certain concept they try and make a hypothetical market that imagine there was a market about this this particular concept even if there is no market this is likely how it will play out and that's how they try and explain with examples about um what the likely costs and benefits would be like you may not have a very precise measure but at least it will be more precise than using the broad terms that law automatically puts in place so that's just giving you a broad idea about the the way in which interdisciplinary uh, systems might work and how it sort of works in the law and economics field um at the outset itself i tried to explain to you how law and economics and economic analysis sometimes differ from each other this is important also to try and point out two different ways in which economics can help out with legal analyses one is the positive sense this comes without any moral um presumptions of any kind from beforehand it just tries to apply economic tools so as to further perhaps objectives that the law already has in place for example if you want to promote contracts if you want to ensure that more people enter into transactions and they try to enter into contracts instead of continuing to fight they will suggest that a contract law of some kind is important that uh, there should be somebody in place uh, there should be some government in place that can enforce contracts uh, and that's a way in which an objective like contract formation or ease of doing business can be um, can be increased in a almost quantitative manner that's why you have an ease of doing business index and different kinds of legal analysis might suggest that uh, reducing backlogs here or creating special courts there or changing the procedural procedural laws in certain kinds of situations might increase ease of doing business this this doesn't uh, necessarily force any economic values onto law but where law already has certain values economics can try and measure whether or not those values are being met this is a positive analysis without any normative suggestion from law coming from economics coming in and colonizing law you know uh, trying to get into law and saying that no you lawyers don't know what you're doing and it should actually happen in this manner that's not often the way in which law and economics has to work um on the other hand there might be normative economics as well and we will get to that in a moment uh, but it's also worth pointing out that the same way in which law and economics has often been trying to push suggestions regarding reform of law to lawyers in the same way psychology has also been trying to push a lot of suggestions regarding how economics should be conducted to economists this is broadly how the behavioral Uh, behavioral studies has been uh, shaped uh, uh, for example one of the only um, uh, persons to have won the nobel prize for economics who is not an economist 
or actually the only person who is not an economist to have won an, a Nobel Prize for economist, uh, economics uh, is a psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, who was working from an experimental position, trying to explain behaviorally how people actually engage in uh, economic transactions or economic decision making. And they do so without any assumptions like the assumptions that economics normally has. If you have studied a bit of basic economics, you'll remember many of these presumptions that come in. Ceteris paribus, for example, is one of the basic presumptions that they try and put into place when trying to explain the law of demand and supply or how equilibrium gets created in that sort of a situation. Uh, that you have to assume that no other uh, variable is at play. What behavioral studies often does is it tries to create uh, take away those presumptions and tries to explain what would happen even if those presumptions or assumptions were not made. My broad idea, the broad idea that I'm, that I'm trying to explain is that not only economics, but various other scientific disciplines have been pushing our uh, fields of study of human behavior further and further away from abstraction towards more scientific and mathematical measures. They try and make it more mathematical. So I want you to look at this particular field also as in that direction. It fails in various points, but that's the broad direction in which it moves. Now we come to the issue of normative law and economics. What do I mean by a normative law and economics? It means broadly where law and economics tries and gives suggestions or advice regarding how you should be doing things. It isn't, it isn't uh, saying that things are going fine right now. Let's try and explain how things can go better. But of course, to, be try, to try and explain how things should be better, it has to have some kind of concept in place as to how things should be or some standard against which you have to measure. Now, uh, you will realize that uh, at the very outset, when I was talking about that translation from rights to costs, uh, rights to benefits or uh, rights to goods or prices to, sorry, duties to prices, one of the things that may have struck some people is that this is a little bit unorthodox and it's a little bit odd to say so. Uh, one tries to often, and one is often trained in the legal field to look at the question of rights as something that is in itself moral and normative. This is often a natural law tradition. If you remember these sorts of concepts from uh, jurisprudence, the idea is that certain kinds of rights are innate in individuals and they cannot be changed or alienated away. They're inalienable rights. And so the idea that these rights should be subject to a calculation, some kind of calculus, so as to determine how much you should be able to keep make exceptions to those rights or how much you should be allowed to erode those rights. Many people find this sort of a thing uh, a bit uh, distasteful that you shouldn't be able to do this, that the rights are supposed to be trumps. They're supposed to be um, uh, things that you can't violate just because somebody is going to be better off. Uh, right. So the, the standard that law and economics tries to apply when it tries to make suggestions uh, is often the standard which is often a standard that some law and economic scholars call wealth maximization. Other economic scholars call it cost minimization. Broadly, the idea seems to be from that point of view that if a person is able to pay for something or is willing to pay for something more, is willing to pay more for something, they should get that thing because that will ensure that there is what you might have heard the term, um, the greatest good for the greatest number. It's kind of a maximization standard that you try and make uh, society as a whole as well off as you can, as happy as you can. Um, and the idea often gets translated into a very market based logic that if you are willing to pay for it, then you should be able to get it. And if somebody is willing to pay for it less, then maybe they shouldn't be getting it in that sense. So that's the way in which many law and economic scholars try to explain this sort of a concept. It's, a, it's like a cost benefit analysis in many ways. But um, this sort of a view that everything gets changed into a market analysis, it, the reason why it often seems distasteful to people is because it seems like it's all about money, that you're trying to make sure that people get wealthy or society as a whole gets wealthy. This isn't necessarily a mis this is sort of a misconception because the idea isn't necessarily to get people to have more money. The idea is often just to increase human welfare to make sure that people are better off than they used to be before or that society would be worse off in terms of happiness or utility if we don't make our rules in a particular way. Um, so uh, I'll just add in a couple of more uh, concepts to this particular mix. Uh, one particular concept is called Pareto efficiency. Uh, you don't need to remember the name as such to be able to engage with this concept. 
this is like a minimum concept of efficiency that economists try to employ mm-hmm. idea is broadly that you should be able to do if you are able to do good for some people without causing harm for anybody then that is a good thing to do that you have not caused any negative outcomes but only positive outcomes mm-hmm. that you can understand basically is pareto efficiency as long as something is causing betterment without anybody being harmed and this is not a cost benefit analysis it's just nobody is harmed at all but some people are getting better off then that's a good thing now this sort of an analysis um is sometimes contrasted with a different kind of efficiency called calder hicks efficiency which is the cost benefit analysis that if some people are being made better off and some people are also suffering some costs as long as the benefits are high enough that those people who are suffering costs can be compensated then that's fine i won't uh, get into the uh, nuances of why one of them is chosen over the other this is just to give you some of the tools so that we can discuss some of the concepts and uh, uh, i mean some of the examples a little later but broadly these are the standards against which law and economics likes to assess legal rules and tries to say that yes this legal rule or this case did the right thing or this particular legislature should make a rule now so as to ensure that society becomes better off because if you don't do that then um there will be more costs than benefits or uh, you are missing out on an opportunity to make people better off uh so this is the source of all the policy prescriptions and sometimes it becomes the source of interpretation as well to legal practitioners um i wouldn't want to go too deep into the subject of how law and economics can help in legal practice one thing is for sure law and economics is the basis for many of our economic laws uh competition law for example is broadly based on economic concepts and values uh the idea being that consumer welfare can be increased by increasing competition in uh, in markets and uh, the tools that are used are economic tools when they try to explain what a relevant market is they try and explain that that market is determined on the basis of whether or not goods in that particular market are substitutable if substitutability is there then that is the relevant market to look at and the idea is that you go to the smallest relevant market and that's the place in which you check whether one of the players has a dominance uh, in that market has a market share higher than the other market players so um but it nonetheless needs to be pointed out that economic analysis has not stopped itself has not restrained itself just to economic laws it has gone ahead and looked at all other laws right down to constitutional law as well which is considered broadly the most legalistic of laws in many ways and it's also the field of law and economics that i am most interested in um but uh to give you an example of how one of these sorts of uh uh policy prescriptions gets made one of the most classic examples is that the way we decide whether or not um somebody should be liable for an accident a road accident let's say uh is to decide whether or not that person had the duty to avoid that accident whether or not they were negligent depends on whether they had that duty or not in reasonable foreseeability this sort of a test is applied now how do you decide what is reasonably foreseeable when you say the word reasonable many law and economics people jumped in and they said that uh, the way in which to decide what is a reasonable uh, duty to place on somebody here can be decided by a cost benefit analysis as well here it's it's, it's measuring between two costs uh, which is to say the cost broadly speaking the way in which they try and determine what is a reasonable duty to place on somebody regarding accidents is to determine the balance between two different kinds of costs one is the cost of the accident itself there can be accidents which are very bad because you didn't even say um lubricate the uh, particular valves in an engine you didn't you didn't use a lubricant or you didn't repair a brake you knew the brake was uh, you know it was broken but you didn't repair it uh, that's that's the cost of an accident was clear to you from that but there are also certain costs that are at place when you're trying to avoid accidents so if the costs of avoiding an accident for example driving at 10 kilometers per hour all the time and everybody driving at 10 kilometers per hour uh, if the costs of avoiding the accident are so high that um they are higher than the costs of the accident themselves then it's considered likely that that's not a reasonable duty to place on someone that you the law should not say that somebody should drive at 10 kilometers per hour and this is often very intuitive for us but the fact that in some cases we are a little unsure about how to place the duty uh, that leads economists to suggest that if you want a more precise analysis about how to phrase a law or how to frame a law or how to decide a case 
that could be on the basis of measuring and balancing these sort of costs um i'll move forward to now where these where economics broadly where, what's the broad basis for them suggesting these sort of things uh, at the outset itself i need to mention that um the way economists often look at many of our human interactions our social interactions is that they have um a considerable faith in markets and transactions and they suggest that markets should be our default that we should be able to trade things with each other if we need to and if we want to and as long as we are able to trade things with each other then somebody who really wants something she will end up getting it because she will be willing to pay more for it than the person who wants it less the situations in which law in which economists or economic analysts are more certain that the government needs to step in and that there needs to be some law in place is where markets fail this is a broad uh, broadly speaking this is the general approach that economic analysis has regarding rule making that where there is market failure you should put in a rule of some kind or the other so one place where markets fail of course is when monopolies get created when a monopoly gets created it's very likely that uh, they will try and use their monopoly so as to be able to reduce consumer welfare they'll raise high they will after having gained that monopoly if there is no competition that is challenging them they will be able to increase their prices again and if there was competition of course the prices may have fallen because this competitor would try and meet the prices of the competitor without the competitor they will increase the prices so overall society becomes worse off with monopolies similarly many transactions contain externalities for example if i um, enter into a transaction so as to buy certain kinds of goods uh, the fact remains that i don't often have to pay or even the person who produced that good or manufactured that good does not have to pay for the pollution that got created because of the um, production of that good you don't have to pay for it the producer doesn't have to pay for it who is paying for it it's generally society as a whole so this sort of a situation is what economists like to call externalities there are various discussions about how this sort of a term is too vague and it's not clear often when an externality is in place but that's the broad idea that markets have failed if you have not internalized an externality so what laws try to do is they try and create an internalization of the externality on the part of the manufacturer for example they try and say that the manufacturer needs to incur some costs so as to minimize pollution so that society doesn't have to suffer as much and often they pass off those costs into the price of the good itself so the customer also has to pay for the reduction of pollution by paying for the good or the product that they are buying so this is again another kind of market failure another kind of market failure is public goods or commons what is called tragedy of the commons this sort of a market failure happens when um for example this again i can use an example from pollution uh, if nobody owns a particular um, patch of ground or nobody considers a lake or a river or a pond to be their pond uh, they often don't feel any incentive or they don't feel any uh, desire internally to keep that pond clean or to keep that river clean so they freely throw things into that river or they throw things into that pond or they litter and this often creates a tragedy of the common situation that just because something is held commonly by society instead of being owned by particular people privately it is likely that they are going to pollute it or reduce its value by using it up one of these situations uh, for example uh, one example of a public good can be defense our armed forces for example let's say we had private armed forces only the kinds of people who would want to pay for the private armed forces uh, in a particular area would be those people who live close to the borders of a political entity like a country so somebody who is likely to get missiles from a neighboring country or get more soldiers from a neighboring country who will attack that country will li will likely want to pay more for the private armed forces they will say that hey uh, you are a security force why don't you defend my house here uh, near punjab and near the pakistan border but that it so happens that that same cost incurred by that person in punjab trying to defend the border there is actually benefiting people who are all over the country because the army is not able to come in from punjab all the way down to maharashtra or all the way down to delhi and because people aren't incentivized to pay for that defense forces uh, the costs that are incurred by uh, 
people near the border they often are not as much as it could be if everybody was paying for it this is why governments are considered necessary at the very least so as to ensure defense of a particular national territory uh, and these governments can then you know they can spread the costs of this sort of a public good amongst the entire population of the country instead of having to only require certain people at the border to pay for it so this is again a kind of market failure if you try and only go by markets you only try, try and go by private initiative then this is the sort of problem that could get created lastly let me give you the example of another the last kind of market failure information asymmetry and i'll use an example which is more contemporary so um uh, many of you may have heard about informational privacy and data protection what is the kind of market failure that is taking place in data protection when you see many of these transactions that you take with uh, a digital entity with somebody who wants to get your data the kind of transaction that is happening is that they are giving you some digital service they might be taking some money for it but they are also often taking your data as well and when they are taking your data they they sometimes treat this data like a price because they are getting some benefit out of it they are able to give you targeted ads and they get payment from the advertisers uh, so it it's like a transaction it's like a market but there are so many information asymmetries in this particular transaction in a free market what is the kind of information asymmetry that's taking place here what is an information asymmetry to start with um it should be very clear people who have learned contract law are clear that consent for a contract should be informed for example it should be adequately informed all the things which are necessary so as to ensure that a free transaction is taking place all that information should be in the mind of the person engaging in that transaction but what is happening in this situation when you are giving your data to somebody you often do not know what is happening with that data you don't know whether that data is being transferred to somebody else whether it is being publicized whether it is being used to give you targeted ads whether it is being uh, you know aggregated with other kinds of data to find out things about you that even you don't know so all of these also cause externalities to you in a way because somebody is transacting away your data and you somehow have become a third party in a transaction about your own data so these kinds of strange market failures results in a suggestion that there should be some law now what is the kind of law that information asymmetry normally likes to put in place it likes to put in place a disclosure so for example if you're trying to buy used cars you need to know often how old the car is whether the car has been in an accident before whether it has had to be repaired and if you don't get that information society as a whole suffers because uh, you often feel the risk uh, you know of taking that kind of a used car and you find that risk so high that you're not willing to buy that car at a high price you 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 like to reduce the price of the car and say that no this is too risky so as a whole society produces cars at a lower cost and they are unable to produce as many cars because they don't get as much revenue this sort of a society as a whole in in economic sense becomes inefficient so um uh, in the digital sense in this in information asymmetry between the person taking your data and the person you the person who is giving the data this information asymmetry um you don't know what's happening with the data uh the the person who's taking the data doesn't know what you want to keep private you might want to keep a particular thing private particularly but you are unable to express that because expressing that to them to that person will actually violate your own privacy i can't say that i don't want to give you my location data because i want to meet somebody here and that will cause some um you know issue with uh, i i don't want the fact that i'm going to this particular uh this particular psychologist psychiatrist or this therapist i don't want it to be known by other people uh and i can't tell you that so what do i do i just simply don't give you the permission to get my location data and as a result i lose out on many services so the disclosure in data protection is often not that way it doesn't work from me to you telling you what i want to keep private i don't tell that as such what instead happens is that that person who's processing your data gives you notice and it tries to explain to you what the data is supposed to be used for and these disclosures are supposed to help you make the decision whether or not you want to give the data of course this is also not very um it's not i mean optimal because you don't read the uh, the privacy policy in detail and these are the sort of problems that data protection has to deal with that despite there being an information asymmetry how can we try and deal with informational privacy um again i want to point out quickly that this standard of efficiency there's often many misconceptions about it because the term efficiency if you just use it it sounds very it's sort of it's sort of uh, anticlimactic because 
you don't really care about whether often in in questions of public importance you don't care about whether something is happening efficiently you care about whether justice is being done whether something is happening in that sense whether you know in the broad public sense justice is being done but i i mean broadly it needs to be understood that efficiency isn't to be looked at in the same way that one looks at individual efficiency often that oh i need to spend 5 minutes on this if i spend more than 5 minutes i will not be able to do something else and i'll be inefficient if i take if i slowly try and uh, you know explain everything in this talk for example i won't be able to cover everything i'm being inefficient that sort of an understanding of inefficiency isn't the understanding that law and economics likes to use because they are coming from the uh, understanding of aggregate welfare of society as a whole being efficient or inefficient so at that aggregate level these costs and benefits work in such a broad way that one is able to explain it in a more public sense that publicly speaking there is a welfare issue and there is an efficiency issue as a result so i'm just trying to get why that particular misconception mm-hmm. could exist so um the way law and economics likes to suggest that you make that switch between markets and uh, you make that switch towards um law instead is that there should be transaction costs if there are zero transaction costs if there is nothing preventing you from engaging in a transaction in a market that is to say that if there is nothing stopping you from going somewhere and trying to transact away a particular uh, property that you have or something that you possess uh, in favor of some price that you receive some particular uh, price that you charge somebody then often the situation is very nice uh, because you get money and you get money at a cost uh, you know you get the amount of money that you really wanted uh, money that you value more than the thing itself like if i want to sell a cup and i get 50 rupees for it maybe uh, i don't know 100 rupees then uh, that 100 rupees is probably if i agree to that transaction that 100 rupees is probably more valuable to me than the cup the value of the cup and if somebody is willing to give you that 100 rupees and get that cup clearly they probably think of that cup as being valued at 100 or more for them so as a whole society becomes better off you are happy they are happy this sort of a logic that economics tries to push is the trigger for that switch that if there are any barriers to transactions the kinds of barriers that are that we talked about in market failures like information asymmetries or externalities and um those sort of situations or if it's too costly for you to find someone who wants to buy what you want to sell then those are the situations in which law needs to step in and try and create a rule it could try and simulate what a market would do if there were no transaction costs so you should not underestimate what this level of transaction cost is it is it's not just about whether you can find somebody to transact with it is all the barriers that prevent transactions and that might as well be conflict the very fact that you and somebody else simply do not agree on something and that disagreement results in a level of uncertainty that cannot be resolved by a market that's the level to which you should be able to view transaction costs and uh, in that sense you'll be able to understand where economics is able to help more and where it's able to help less where the transaction costs are extremely high and where they are insurmountable where there are conflicts that cannot be reconciled it's clear that those are the situations where economics is often least useful or seems least useful at least um but nonetheless this sort of a this sort of an approach of econ- economic and analysts uh is what creates that bias in favor of transactions and markets i want to point out here that while i have been explaining all of this about economic analysis of law i have been doing so so as to be able to explain to you the traditional approach of law and economics this is not to say that there are no problems with law and economics as such the first issue that one can think about is that the very reasons that one feels that competitive markets are good could be the very reasons why one might also think that cooperation might be good i like to think of this as um, you know uh, pointing out that markets are not really a, a place where transactions are the main idea or agreement is the main idea uh, and uh, you know politics is a kind of market as well this is how economists look at it uh, politics is a kind of market law is also a kind of market transactions are happening in that way or we should we should hypothetically imagine that transactions are happening there as well instead i like to think that markets also are in a way an alternative dispute resolution system how is that so if i go to a grocery store and i say hey i want this piece of bread now what is the level of my preference in a sense my preference could be that i want to take that piece of bread and walk away without paying anything and if economics really cares about my welfare 
then it should be able to say that hey um you should go with that bread that's fine and uh, the markets don't matter but nonetheless economics would have to say that there is some reason why even markets have to resolve that dispute between you and the grocery store owner the grocery store owner wants to charge you 15 bucks for the bread you want to pay only 0 bucks and walk away what the market does using a social system of demand and supply as per ordinary a traditional economic theory at least is that it tries and arrives at a demand and supply equilibrium where you will be able to arrive at a price which is socially optimal at which you should transact for that piece of bread the way you can look at this is that it's a dispute resolution it's a resolution between the dispute between you and the grocer so uh, you should keep all of this in mind that economics has this kind of bias but that nonetheless law has a lot to teach economics as well in a way so uh, i would urge everybody if you if you decide to go forward and explore economic analysis more to go with an open mind and um, if you see concepts that you don't like or if you find it distasteful you should be willing to be able to explore different ways in which you can challenge law and economics or you can mold law and economics in a way which can better account for these sort of issues that seem distasteful um i explained that pareto efficiency as a standard earlier you will remember uh, that idea that sometimes if you make somebody better off but you don't harm anybody else then surely that's a good measure right um you will immediately recall that uh, this is the sort of logic that is there in the uh, citizenship amendment act the citizenship amendment act does what it gives certain kinds of benefits regarding getting citizenship at a or getting naturalization in a faster route to certain religious members of certain religious uh, religions but it excludes others now this sort of a choice that you benefit some people without harming other people might very well seem like hey this is pareto efficient that you are not causing harm to anybody and this sort of a constraint from economics then should be fine that oh this is all right this is where the critique for pareto efficiency is also important and where probably law and economics needs to develop further to try and understand other questions as well and it's not that it hasn't it's just that probably i won't be able to explain all those critiques and uh, the non traditional or the more new mechanisms of law and economics right now um but some of the critiques are this that um, uh, pareto efficiency if you say that oh we want to make some people better off and not harm anybody else what it ignores is that where do people start out with at the first place everybody is at a starting point and they are often at different starting points they have different levels of equality of opportunity uh, often also you need to think about the forward looking way in which um uh, the distribution of goods takes place um that you might need to do redistribution or you, you need to think about the distributive effects of a law uh, for example you might suggest in the example of the caa that um there are only a limited set of people limited set of immigrants that we can take on as citizens and as long as you think of that as a limited resource then giving that limited resource to some people while excluding others is nonetheless a distributive issue so some people are being harmed in a way even if you say that in the immediate sense nobody is being harmed because you're benefiting some people um so uh, this is again uh, some some kind of uh, the kinds of issues that we need to build into law and economics better distributive issues this is often termed as the distributive deficit in law and economics so um uh, i mean one should always keep in mind that law is at all times trying to create some kind of distribution when it is trying to uh, make a choice between different sets of rules yeah just before i get there i'll give you a small example of the distributive effects of a choice of legal policy uh, for example if um, you will remember in contract law there was this example of uh, when somebody is a uh, in a creditor debtor relationship if somebody is lending to somebody else and a third party is guaranteeing that loan that if the debtor is unable to pay then the guarantor will pay that loan for the debtor that there was a point when there was no contract law and only cases were there in courts and there was a question as to whether the creditor the person who gave the loan can ask the guarantor for the loan uh, to be returned without having asked the debtor yet now, i don't care whether the debtor can pay or not i want to approach the guarantor and ask them to give uh, to pay the money so in that situation law itself doesn't autonomously come up with a solution but there is nonetheless a distributive question involved and we have to think about that distributive question so as to come up with a good rule and the good rule might be that the institution of guaranteeing isn't as important as the institution of lending perhaps we need to encourage people to lend more 
and if we if we want to encourage people to lend more we should give the benefit of doubt to the to the creditor the creditor should be able to go to the guarantor and ask for it should freely be able to do so uh, there are alternative explanations as to why the guarantor might want to uh, my why the rule should also allow for approach to the guarantor but what i want to point out is that law automatically on its own cannot come up with it it has to be interdisciplinary so as to be able to come up with an answer as to whether the creditor can or cannot approach a guarantor without having approached the debtor all right so um yeah that pretty much covers what i wanted to explain to give you the basics of law and economics a few couple of additional points um one there was a case not not too long back around 4 5 years back uh where for the first time the indian supreme court acknowledged this field called law and economics it was just a secret in this case called shiv shakti sugars versus shri renuka sugars sugar limited this particular case was about essential commodities you will realize that it was an economic law that's why um and the way in which uh, it was i mean it was not applied in a very rigorous sense and while uh, just a secret explained what economic analysis of law is uh it didn't give a full idea about all the things it could be applied to uh but that's something you can look out at that um this is a place in which you can see an example of where law and economics was acknowledged in india another example i can give is um this particular book uh, kaushik basu who was a former chief economic advisor he has written a book called the republic of beliefs it's a new a new approach to law and economics uh, this is an example for one of the first few times where a leading economist in india has written about law and economics um and this gives a particular approach to how law and economics works from a game theory approach what he says is that law creates a focal point in a way according to which different people can coordinate their behavior with each other so as to be able to um arrive at coordinated behavior um and law is the place that focal point on which it's around uh, around which uh, behavior often revolves um so you can see law and economics is slowly starting to develop in india as well Uh, there are a number of colleges that are teaching law and economics courses uh, in their syllabus uh, especially in ba uh, in in the ba integrated courses uh, so definitely watch out for it and um, be ready to uh, explore this kind of a field uh, with an open mind and uh, challenge it where it needs to be uh, i'll stop here i think i've already reached uh, beyond what i thought i would have uh, but um, i hope i have been uh, somewhat clear about the concepts that law and economics involves and that the examples have sort of explained those concepts can you give an example for pareto efficient and hicks theory um <clears throat> so uh one example for pareto efficiency in calder hicks theory i'll give from the field in which i'm sort of more interested in which is the right to equality in constitutional law recently you'll see there were some cases in fact there was a case in 2005 also ev chennaiya where the question was uh whether or not you should be able to sub classify between um scheduled castes or whether state governments should be able to sub classify between scheduled castes uh or are scheduled castes one homogeneous entity all the reservations that are provided to scheduled castes equal reservations have to be provided to all scheduled castes and it should not be possible to provide some people with more and some people with less within the category of scheduled castes uh now pareto efficiency if if let's say you start allowing for classification or scheduled uh, sub classification of scheduled castes one of the questions that could come up is whether or not that sub classification should permit whether to give benefits to some castes more than the others and reduce the benefits reduce the level of uh, seats of reservation available to other scheduled castes that would be calder hicks perhaps if there are only a limited set of seats then you can think that the benefit of providing scheduled caste reservations to some castes which are the worst off would be higher so that benefit is so high that the cost of reducing the benefits for the reservations to more well off scheduled castes can be offset so that's like a cost benefit an analysis cost benefit analysis so that's like calder hicks right on the other hand pareto efficiency is what the court in davinder singh very recently sounded like it was trying to go for that no you cannot reduce the level of reservation of anyone but you can increase the level of reservation for some so those who need it most you can increase their benefits but you cannot reduce the benefit of anybody who al- who is already getting it so maybe that can give you an example of how in law especially mm-hmm. in a distributive question um there is a uh, there is a distinction 
between cost benefit and providing benefit without causing any costs or harms great uh, the next question is how does a lawyer slash economist determine what externalities to consider and what to leave out basically how to determine a hierarchy of external factors uh, and the way the way economics sort of looks at it is that uh, it looks at it very i mean quantitatively speaking um, many externalities don't seem to be uh, so big that uh, you want to be able to uh, internalize it using a rule because there are many costs in being able to internalize that rule in the first place and this is something i didn't touch upon but many economists they are so sold on the market idea the idea that markets are the default that they suggest that markets have failed that's not a problem the government shouldn't come in because the government will fail even worse so that's not an issue that there's externalities that sometimes the markets are not accounting for certain kinds of costs because if the government steps in it will become even more costly so those are sort of the ways in which traditionally economics likes to look at this and says that uh, uh, no this is not an externality we need to bother about and it might say that no that is an externality that we do need to bother about for example the distinction between uh, private laws and public laws or uh, criminal law and civil law criminal law seems to be an externality which mm -hmm. is spread across society where if one person has a crime against them if that crime is not redressed then the tendency or the incentives to the criminals is that they should be able to do it more and society as a whole suffers so those are the sort of externalities that seem much more problematic and it's sort of quantitative only i guess that's the best way in which to suggest it from the traditional yes. economic sense yes it uh, that is uh, quite lucid in your explaining um the next question is econo is economic analysis of law mainly about the ends and not the means is there any space for recognizing the moral costs of a particular choice right these are the sort of topics in which i have the deepest interest uh, and they often lead you into certain areas in which law and economics has been weakest law and economics is sort of a political theory in a way and it's sort of a legal theory also but unlike other forms of legal theory it doesn't explain a lot of things uh, like how is law different from other things uh, or why should a person you know uh, adhere to a law at all or um, or some kind of theory of adjudication or how should judges uh, decide things it doesn't often give examples of many of these situations um but uh, i would like to i guess plug my own uh, <laughs> uh, the the things that i would seek to be working on i i'm currently a fellow working on uh, an economic analysis on the right to equality which in a sense is the very right that seems least amenable to economic analysis and broadly speaking the way i try to explain it Uh, is that there are many rights in which we are unable to make distinctions and make those measurements because the cost of making those measurements is too high so um for example uh, broadly speaking many of our moral uh, intuitions i suggest could be situations where we have information paucity where there is less information available to us um and because we don't have information available to us we are unable to discriminate and because we are unable to discriminate it is actually efficient to treat everyone equally if i do not know or if there is no feasible physical way in which i can measure the life the value of human life or uh, the value of human dignity the suggestion should be that everybody should get the get an equal amount of human dignity that i give equal human dignity to everybody because i can't pick and choose between who is or is not going to get more and this moralistic reasoning comes very often in human life you'll realize let's say that you are a student who is giving or you are a teacher who has put a particular deadline on a project that you have to submit this project to me by 25th december if you don't submit it by 25th december then uh, you will get some penalty now let's say that somebody comes on 27th december and says that ma'am i tried to submit this i tried to finish this project by 25th but i could not do it because i was really interested in the subject i put my heart into it now somebody approaching this from a policy perspective might say hey if somebody is really putting their heart into a project they should get exceptions but this exceptionalism goes against equality because it is often difficult for a teacher to be able to verify and assess who can who did or did not put their heart into a project somebody could lie about it somebody may have been doing something else and these things become difficult to verify or observe and because of the difficulty of observation itself we come up with this idea of equality 
this is only an alternative argument i don't suggest that it's the only reason why equality is a good thing but it's a good reason it's a good way in which to explain why there is a practical reason to treat people equally true uh, the next question is how do we balance utilitarian policies vis-a-vis -vis individual rights while drafting policies this is also it runs along very similar uh, it, it runs along a very similar point of view and i can only answer it in the same way uh, you will find that um, in most of our um, fundamental rights in fact the the general understanding is that all fundamental rights are subject to some reasonable restrictions or the other in equality it is reasonable classification um, in uh, in the article 15 and 16 equality uh, you know the other kinds of equality safeguards uh um, the exceptions are in favor of affirmative action uh in uh, in article 19 and 21 also there are exceptions uh, to the broad phrasing of the rules themselves uh all of these reasonable restrictions in my opinion at least operate in a way that is sort of economic in the sense that it is willing to measure it is willing to measure between this moral and inalienable right and between uh, some countervailing interest and this this uh, sense that you can measure or create these exceptions and restrictions it often leads you and if you do it in the complete confidence in economics you will be able to say that oh everything can be measured away in this sense that i can make an exception to anything and everything but again that question comes up where that measurement can go wrong because of slippery slopes where it is possible that because i allowed for an exception here or i allowed for a reasonable restriction here tomorrow that precedent will allow for another similar one and it's difficult for you to predict these things and it's difficult when you make a broad rule that exceptions are allowed here that uh, you might uh, you might be allowing for more exceptions than you yourself thought at the time it's this idea of uncertainty about what you might do when you start creating exceptions that should keep uh, should give people pause regarding allowing for restrictions and exceptions in the first place and it broadly i think creates that moral uh, bastion that uh, fundamental rights holds that they do trump other kinds of um uh welfare considerations that even if you think something will make society better off you should sometimes not do it because it might actually make society worse off in the long run because you could not predict what it was going to do true uh the next question is could economic analysis of law have led the government in ruling in favor of the government in aadhar case vis-a-vis -vis a general good to difficult to quantify and right to privacy right so this particular question uh this is a very troubling question because uh, as i explained earlier this informational costs that are there uh, in the government being able to uh, determine who uh, who to allocate what to and how to verify uh, whether or not uh, somebody should receive a good or not this often seems to be easily you know addressed by uh, questions of easier identification or technological augmentation of identification systems so aadhar seems intuitively to do this very well it makes identification very easy it makes it less costly and it it doesn't require you to hire more personnel uh, who have to go through a lot of identification papers spend a lot of uh, you know personnel hours before they can verify that yes this person deserves a uh, ration or this person uh, deserves to get a uh, you know this particular narega benefit uh, and it says that you just put your thumbprint on this machine and ho gaya uh, you have found out that this person is a is an aadhar card holder and it has been categorized as deserving of this particular benefit so this gives a lot of uh, reasons for aadhar aadhar's main um, what do you call it uh, its main uh, normative benefit to be efficiency only that efficiency is the thing that aadhar uh, increases in many senses it also is suggested that it increases autonomy because you don't have to pay bribes to a person uh, so as to be able to get that government benefit um, so those are other ways in which it gets suggested but the way constitutional law needs to look at questions like aadhar is from the privacy perspective in the anti totalitarian sense that aadhar's biggest uh, issues and this is my personal view at the at, at my current stage um that its biggest issues have to do with the centralization of power that it creates and the risks that arise as a result of that um uh, these are the sort of issues that often don't get countered through economic analysis best and they often require other forms of analysis which requires individualism to be uh, furthered in a better sense that that individual right to privacy cannot be looked at in another sense i have certain ideas why nonetheless even privacy and an anti totalitarian conception of privacy 
uh, that uh, excess centralization is bad can also be argued from an economic point of view but i won't go into that right now uh, because i am also not very clear on how i can argue it best the next question is what are the assumptions to human behavior that an economic theory factors in while understanding common good and their destruction due to non ownership typically i think the person is trying to say that you are assuming that a human being will react or act in a particular manner ah, yes 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 okay okay no 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 i get it no so yeah um, one of the assumptions is often that um, that a person is self interested and is a rational actor and therefore is only self interested and does not have any uh, social interests or empathy or you know sense of charity or something uh, that is already innate in you that wants to do the common good um and this is often one of the arguments why people say that economics should not be applied to constitutional law because many of our interests in constitutional law are socialized and they are not self interested uh this is a debate that um, is worth going into and uh, my suggestion would be that even if you depart from the uh, depart from economics general uh, assumption regarding the rational actor's self interest that doesn't prevent you from applying economics nonetheless because it's possible in many kinds of economics particularly those which use social welfare functions this is social choice theory the kind that amartya sen that indian guy who won the uh, nobel prize for economics that's the kind of thing that he uses using social welfare functions you can actually say that somebody's preference is increased or or is satisfied when certain kinds of fairness functions are satisfied that uh, that a person can be interested in fairness and that person can be happier even if they are not directly benefited because things are fairer in the world many people are fine with taking on costs so as to cause revenge to somebody else because they think that society is better off you know because uh, or they are willing to punish people at great individual cost because they think society is better off so these sort of interests are natural and they happen to humans and these are the kinds of things that economics needs to move towards by abandoning some of its old assumptions how far it needs to go and how far our models need to account for it is still worth determining after greater study so on behalf of pli thank you very much for a truly engaging discussion on the economic analysis of law it was a very uh, unique and interesting concept and i'm sure everyone has benefited from your expertise and your experience thank you very much uh, i hope that by the end of it i was able to get you a little interested in this kind of thinking that it is worth measuring sometimes even if you can't measure always and that where it is possible you should try and apply these kinds of economic tools and measures thank you so much sunita and thank you so much for listening guys thank you so much